Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. This is The Next Reel, everybody. I'm Pete Wright, and that over there is Andy Nelson. Hey, hey, hey. And we spoil movies. Tonight on the show, back to Chile, brightening our experience from last week with Revolution and a Trip to the Morgue in Pablo Lorraine's Postmortem. Before we get into that, you should learn more about us at thenextreel.com. Subscribe to the show and your favorite podcast app, or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at the next reel. And if you're a regular listener of this show and you're interested in supporting our ongoing work investigating great film, please consider a regular donation through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash the next reel. We got a blot spot friend of the show, Ben Lott, writes in with his rebound of Tony Monero. Oh dear, Andy. Oh dear. That's right. He says, every aspect of Tony Monero failed for me. It didn't tell a compelling story. It had an undesirable cast of characters that I didn't want to spend any time with. It had bland or downright non-acting. Even the cinematography was terrible. After watching this movie, I felt like I needed to take a shower. It was so unpleasant and upsetting. I can't fathom why anyone would want to see Tony Monero. But if it sounds interesting to you, then by all means enjoy it. I will gladly never sit through it again. Your rank 299, my rank 298... Although he still hasn't ranked certain women. Looks good on you, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, yeah, dear. we should we should add this has been uh, dramatically cut uh, for broadcast purposes. Yes. yes. Uh, 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 Patreon subscribers in the Slack group, you can go into the Blotspot channel and see the entire unedited director's cut of the Blotspot. It is delightful. Uh, thank you, uh, Ben. Okay, trailers. It's time, Andy. Let's do trailers. <laughs> Andy, the trailer I am picking is in honor of our next speakeasy, which I'm very excited about. Oh, and I yes. feel like we can we should we talk about it, uh, even though it, because it's been recorded. We should. Okay, so next uh, next week, uh, the speakeasy interview is with uh, Harry Gregson Williams, who is a composer of great renown. Uh, if you haven't heard of him, well, go watch The Martian. He did that and many, many, many other films. And he is a terrific guy. And uh, we had a wonderful conversation. And so it pleases me to no end that my trailer this week is for a film that is finally, it's been playing festival circuits for a long time. It finally gets a at least a U.S. release in June, I'm really excited for Score, a film music documentary. And uh, this film is uh, clearly a passion project from Matt Schrader, writer, director. And, you know, he did everything else. He shot it. He edited it and produced it. Uh, and it is uh, he is is telling the story of Hollywood's premier composers to talk about what it takes to make music for film. And I think... Uh, I, you know, obviously both of us uh, love film scores and listen to them quite regularly. Any opportunity to see behind the scenes how these guys go to work and put their work behind our favorite movies is one I'm excited to be a part of. Uh, the people that he talks to, well, A-listers, Hans Zimmer, Danny Elfman, John Williams, Trent Reznor, James Cameron, Randy Newman. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, and uh, uh, it just looks like a, a fantastic catalog of stories about film music. What would you think? Oh, I'm very excited for this one. You know me. I'm a big fan of film score. I collect them. I listen to them all the time. And uh, hearing that this uh, documentary was out there floating around, um, just I've been very excited and anxious to see this when it finally uh, is accessible. And it was great to see the trailer and just get excited, you know, hearing all these these uh, composers. I mean, just some amazing composers in this and uh, some some that are bigger than others. But it's just they, they all have such an interesting breadth of work that is exciting to get a chance to hear them really kind of talking about this, this hidden side of things. And, you know, I'm curious um, how the conversation is going to go, knowing that. Um, you know, there's this. The, there's been changes and shifts in the world of uh, film composing, and how the big themes that everybody talks about. We actually, we even talked about this on on uh, our last uh, film board, as far as uh, the music um, for the circle, and how kind of the themes. Uh, really, you're not hearing as many of those great big themes that we all uh, know and love, and and can so easily uh, sing along with. Um, and so, I'm curious if if that's going to come up as something as as the uh, film scoring uh, community and, and, and just the body of work has been shifting if they're going to bring that up. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm super fascinated by this whole thing and can't wait to see what these guys have to say. So this has been floating around the uh, f uh, festival circuit, as I mentioned, for the last uh, eight, six, eight months or so. Uh, we've got a Canadian and U.S. release simultaneously June 16th, 2017. Uh, so watch your uh, local multiplex. Uh, no international dates as of yet. Well, Pete, you know me. I'm picking stuff that's going to scare you and probably JJ. <laughs> oh, good grief. <laughs> that's right. Uh, you know, you know, it's funny. I was very excited because I wanted to see this movie. It comes at night, directed, written and directed by Trey Edward Schultz. But what's funny about it is it's actually being distributed by A24. And I am finding now that there are a, a select few uh, kind of indie distribution companies out there that when I see a, a new uh, trailer or something listed that they're going to release, it already has piqued my curiosity because I have found that these companies have really worked hard at finding unique materials to release. And it gets me very excited. And so I've started tracking them 
And this, I saw the A24 logo um, on the uh, on the trailer on YouTube, and I instantly knew I wanted to watch the trailer and potentially talk about it. So this is It Comes at Night, a really creepy looking film, like I said, written and directed by Trey Edward Schultz. Uh, the plot on IMDb says, secure within a desolate home as an unnatural threat terrorizes the world, a man has established a tenuous domestic order with his wife and son, but this will soon be put to the test when a desperate young family arrives seeking refuge. It's got Joel Edgerton in it as the uh, the man trying to keep his family safe. And then you have an interesting other cast of, uh, of, uh, of people who kind of are in this world, and you don't know what is outside that red door. And they come at night, and you just don't know what they are, but it's super creepy. And when they go and they see that the red door is accidentally open and they don't know how it got open, bad things start happening. And it just really kind of scares the pants off of me. And I loved watching this trailer. <laughs> And I uh, got very excited. So uh, what do you think of it? I was doing okay. Uh, and, you know, I have to tell you, Andy, you know, I have really invested some time into Letterboxd, uh, you know, really oh, yes. going back and, and starting to catalog all the movies that I've watched. And I've been very surprised at just how many uh, horror movies I've actually seen because I talk a big game like I skip them because I don't like them. But it turns out I've, that's actually not based in fact. I've seen a lot of horror movies and uh, I, I still I, I have this real visceral sense that I don't like them all that much. But um, I was excited about this trailer First of all, because I knew when I saw it that you were going to pick it. <laughs> then I started watching it, and I was fine. I was fine with the creepy stuff. And then she kissed him. She kissed him, Andy. There was the kiss. Yes. Where she was over on top of him in bed and kissed him, and and then the she, like, spit up on his face. The black goo pours out of her face. Oh, God, <laughs> Andy, I have no patience for the black goo in the kiss. That is nasty, man. That is not cool. Oh, that fantastic. is a trailer foul. I oh, loved it. God. Although, when uh. I saw that, I will say, the first thing that came to my mind was, oh, should they have shown that, or is that a little bit of a spoiler? Like, I, I felt like it might have been potentially a spoiler that they put it in there, but yeah. I still enjoyed it. <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I'm... I'm... <sighs> I don't know. It'll probably end up in a series that we do one day because I just have this feeling you're going to find a way to make it happen. Maybe it won't be this year. Maybe it'll be two or three years down the road. We'll probably end up talking to this movie. I, I will probably see it. Uh, so, uh, you know, okay, Trey Edward Schultz, I'm watching you, man. That's right. Let's see how it goes. Well, you know, Pete, it does come at night. <laughs> Uh, this movie is going to open here in the U.S. and Canada, June 9th this year, and then uh, Netherlands the 15th, France the 21st, Australia and New Zealand June 25th. That's all the release dates at this time. I'll have the Peking duck. I'll pretend I'm eating that son of a bitch. <laughs> Transcribo las autopsias que realiza el doctor Castillo. Postmortem, Andy. 2010's Postmortem. This is uh, uh, director Pablo Larraín's second in his unintentional trilogy uh, of uh, the story of Chile and political struggles therein. Uh, this one stars, once again, Alfredo Castro. As Mario Cornejo, we, we catch up with Alfredo again after his work in Tony Manero last week. Uh, also Antonio Ziggers, I don't know, Jaime Vadel, maybe? Sure. Amparo Noguera, yeah, uh, no, and no Marcelo that. Alonso, and a, a, a number of other uh, fine people. And this uh, is, is really telling the story of the, the 1973 coup in Chile, that marked the ascension of Augusto Pinochet uh, in, into political leadership and military leadership in that country. Uh, and, how and, did it hit you? And possibly more important, at least for this particular uh, context, is the uh, the military assassination of Salvador Allende, the then True. leader of Chile. Which yes. kind of ties into the story. Well, it, it ties in quite uh, directly to this story. Exactly. How uh, How does this... How did this film hit you, particularly on the heels of last week's film, which neither of us were great fans? I did find last week's film interesting. This week's film I found 
more interesting, more compelling. I still really struggled with the protagonist, not as much as I did last week. I, I think that uh, the character of Raul um, last uh, week in Tony Monero was just impossible to uh, to connect with. I, I thought there was more going on with Mario in this particular film, um, but really he's just much more of a sad sack, although he still had some strange obsessive tendencies and some things that you know still kind of creep me out. Um, I, what what I think I like about the film is the political side of things and how the story, uh, kind of this personal story, kind of connects with everything going on in, in the political context. Unfortunately, I don't feel like we focus on that enough, or I don't feel like there's enough of a direct connection. So it, I, I found a lot of stuff interesting, but I still was frustrated by it. See, that's an interesting perspective because I don't know that I I entirely agree. I, you know, last week I I made this comparison of the of Tony Monero to the stool that has three legs, right? Where we have the personal, the cultural, and the political relationship of this character to the world around him, and and that two of the legs were very very short, and and so much for so much of the movie, both literally and figuratively, our protagonist was around the corner from the interesting action, right? He was like there was always something really cool going on while he was just being creepy. And I, I didn't, I didn't like that. I didn't connect with it at all. This film does not hide its politics, in in my view. I mean, it 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 shows its politics quite blatantly in the form of uh, bodies, literally, uh, you know, uh, strewn through the halls of the medical examiner's office. It's it's uh, the the story of the you know uh, you know on the the uh, post mortem uh, operating theater. Uh, looking at the the dead uh, leadership, it is really quite open about its politics and the way the character interacts with the politics. But I still have this weird feeling, and I'm interested in your take on this. It feels like Lorraine has picked this story that is great, and he has chosen the wrong protagonist for us, like the wrong guy to to. Be the voice and the eye that we follow through the narrative. I have such a hard time connecting with uh, Alfredo uh, Castro's Mario that I end up leaving this film ultimately disinterested in what is otherwise an incredibly powerful moment in Chilean history. I, I mean, I kind of agree. I, I think what I was saying earlier, I mean, I, I agree. I think the political side of the story is super powerful and really interesting. There's a lot of stuff going on here. And I was interested in that all the time, except when I, I was interested in the film all the time, except when Mario leaves that world and is just kind of at home or, or dealing with his neighbor and stuff like that. And there were elements there that were interesting, especially as it tied into everything that was going on with the political nature of things. But yeah, I think that he he's a very difficult protagonist, a very difficult character to connect with. And um, again, kind of like last week, I don't necessarily need a character who is um, you know going to be uh, like well, like his coworker. I mean, she was. There's definitely something interesting going on with Sandra and her um, kind of her the way that she's coping with this work that they have to do with with. Uh, tracking all these bodies and everything and how she inevitably has this this big breakdown um like i found her character very interesting and if we were following her it would have been maybe perhaps more interesting because there's a real level of of struggle with her and with mario i i couldn't figure out exactly what again kind of like why why does uh lorraine take us on these these journeys where we're following these people I couldn't quite pinpoint what it was about Mario that he was drawn to to uh, tell the story through his eyes. Mario is uh, kind of a difficult character, very quiet character. I mean, he's the, um, I don't know what you'd call him, the scribe for the mortician. He kind of writes everything yeah. down. That, that, that like the, the transcriptionist. Mortician. Yeah, that, that he's uh, kind of saying. Um, and um, and I liked the the kind of the portrayal. I liked just how everybody was gray and they all looked dead themselves. Uh, you know, I liked a lot of that stuff. But it was something about just following this character that I never could really understand um, that did make it difficult. So, you know, I, I kind of agree with you. 
Does that does that make sense? <laughs> Glow, that's a, <laughs> uh, it's really glowing testimony, Andy. I kind of agree with you too. I, uh, it, you know, I to your point where I I violently agree with you. I think both Sandra, in terms of being in the medical examiner's office, Sandra would have been a much more interesting and dynamic character to follow uh, because she had much. She appeared to have much more at stake, right? Her emotional connection with her work, uh, you know, the passion that she felt when she, you know, they discovered that there was a body that was in there that was supposed to be dead but wasn't dead so she healed that person and then found them dead again i mean you get a connection to the medicine uh that and and her work in healing uh that we don't have at all in mario's character like he is a non-participant in in the medical part and and he can't type and it's just there's all this weird stuff i would also say that dr castillo would have been an interesting character to follow as a protagonist he's older he is clearly being manipulated uh in some way shape or form by the military and uh, would have been another interesting sort of voice to to uh, highlight and have a more interesting story and instead we end up with the creep factor of Mario that I I don't think uh, works as as a viable uh, vehicle for the narrative. It just doesn't work for me. I think where it does work is it ties us to this to Nancy and to the you know Nancy's family, her father and 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 the the family's work in in um, you know uh, fighting the the government uh, and and the the rising Pinochet. Um, Efforts, military efforts. So that that is the you know that's sort of the functional, the practical tie between these two stories that that Mario does for us. But man, I just I just I don't like the guy enough to make it worth it. Yeah, it is very hard with him as our protagonist because he's just uh, there's just so much weird things, like strange little obsessive things, like the way that he's uh, just like our last film. He has this obsession with his neighbor Nancy across the who lives across the street from him. Um, and he watches her dance. She's like a showgirl. And, um, uh, you know, it's just, it's kind of obsessive. He's got kind of a weird kind of creepy relationship going on with her little brother. Um, you know, it just, I don't know. I, I really frust, I was frustrated with so much stuff going on um, with him as a character. And all I could think of is that, that Lorraine is really trying to give us characters that somehow like symbolically are representing like the the people in in the society or something like that. I, I just don't know why he latches on to these characters that are so despicable and frustrating for the audience to uh, to have to take the ride with. So I had a hard time with that. But I did like all the political stuff in the film. And I think that's why I found it kind of maybe perhaps more frustrating than Tony Monero because um, because I like all that political stuff. And there's like really interesting, horrifying moments in this film uh, that deal with that. And I think, isn't it maybe that, uh, and, and maybe this is just our tastes or maybe just the execution of this film in particular, but I, I find when we're dealing with a film like this, telling a true, true story, uh, that, that Lorraine's uh, take on it is just too far uh, removed from the story itself, right? I, if you're going to take on this period in history, I would prefer you just take on this period of history and not do it through narrative sleight of hand. And I feel like that's what the, this film is ultimately doing. And I, I was more frustrated uh, than certainly than I expected. I don't know if I completely agree with that because I actually really enjoy films that take characters and they put them in a real situation that happened um, and you're only getting kind of that little perspective of it. I think that's a really interesting way to tell a story and to gain some perspective on those moments of history. But it's really hard when it is a character that you can't connect with. The weird thing is that I found out that this character, that uh, Mario, that uh, that Alfredo is playing, is based on a real person. So... I was like, well, maybe that's why he chose to follow Mario, uh, because there's this real mortician and there was something going on with him. Like now I'm, I'm wondering, who is this Mario Cornejo and what is his story? Like, did he really, uh, you know, lock some people in a room and kill them? Um, did he grow up to be uh, obsessed with uh, Tony Monero? <laughs> Like what's his what's his real story? <laughs> well, isn't isn't that an interesting thing too? Because we know that he's a he's a real person. The the last you know we'll talk about the obviously the last shot. Maybe we should just you know spill it. Uh, but the, that's the story 
I was I found myself more interested in than the story that I just seen. Right? What how what was this guy doing in that last shot and how did that end? And I found it incredibly frustrating. Yeah, it's it's uh I was curious what it was saying politically. Like, is this a person who? Because because there's the other moment when when he is uh, listening to uh, the doctor um, reading or kind of describing the the body of Salvador Allende, the um, now deceased leader of Chile. Um, and at the very end of that description, he has like a little smile on his face. Like, is he kind of? Is there like some strange thrill he gets from seeing the leader of the country dead? Like, was he? I mean, he doesn't seem politically active at all. Like, they run into that demonstration. He's like, oh, God, they're blocking the road. Like, that's all he seems to care about. Um, but then there's well, I that couldn't care if he didn't care about it. I didn't know if he didn't care about it or if he was just not in favor of the communist youth, you know, uprising. Rising, yeah, which is possible. I mean, maybe he was just, he was not a, an Allende supporter. Um, and he was happy that Pinochet took over. Right, and, right. And, I mean, that's entirely possible. And so he was kind of supportive. I mean, he is the one who is saying when he's arguing with um, with Sandra, uh, you know, Sandra is saying he was he was killed. He's saying he killed himself. He was killed. He killed himself. Yeah. He's the one saying, no, 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 it was a suicide. He didn't, you know, he, the, you know, our new government didn't kill him. So perhaps, I mean, perhaps he really is. And then knowing as fascinated as he is with Nancy and as much as he wants to get in her pants, he uses it as an opportunity to, uh, to kill her because she's, you know, she's sleeping with the enemy, so to speak. So, I right. Mean, and and this gets to the his political y- stance. Right. I mean, and this this gets to the uh, the the cultural oppression that occurs. Right. I mean, as a as a result of the increasing conservatism, and you can kind of get this feeling that maybe he was he was making much more of a of a cultural statement that you know what she did was just morally wrong, and um and and this was his action to to right that wrong. And clearly, you know, Pinochet, you know, he did the same thing. I mean, I, you know, and I was just reading up a little bit. I know very little about uh, Pinochet, but reading up a little bit on Wikipedia and, you know, assorted sources uh, that he various invest- investigations have identified the murder of 1,200 to 3,200 people with up to 80,000 people forcibly interned and as many as 30,000 tortured. I mean, this was a guy who's willing to do whatever he could in a dictatorship to maintain rule. And as a result, the, uh, you know, economic inequality that, that resulted was was uh, dramatic. And, and so, um, you know, I, I feel like that is is much more of a representation of who Mario ended up being. I mean, that's that that was my take on on him as a person. Yeah, well, it makes sense. Uh, and it's 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 interesting. And I, I, I kind of like that, then, you know, the way that he ends up ending the film. Um, there's there's some strength to it. I just, you know, I just wish that Lorraine gave me likable protagonist. And and a, a, a protagonist which with I, I think more layers, right? This this was a, a I, I felt like that you didn't have to dig too far to see who this guy was. Yeah, that was that was my. And there were other characters that I was more interested in. Um, so, uh, in, in terms of direction, how do you uh, how do you think he ended up uh, doing uh, Lorraine compared to Monero? Do you do you see uh, evolution of his directing strokes? Well- it's it's an interesting shift because he certainly went from a much more lively film and now looking at these two films side by side it's interesting to see okay Tony Monero I mean everything was moving there was a lot of stuff going on I mean it was it was about the disco era it was about you know this character who is obsessed with Tony Monero the character in uh, Saturday Night Fever and so everything was moving and running and there was so much energy this film was about morticians and uh, kind of looking at these dead bodies. There was so much stillness in this film. And it was just, it was kind of, it just sat there. And I mean, it was kind of, you know, a little difficult to watch because there was just so little motion at times. And you'd be staring at something for quite a long time. And I thought it was a very interesting decision to tell the story that way. So, I mean, to that extent, I thought Lorraine uh, definitely showed kind of a, a, a sense of growth as far as really kind of fine-tuning the way that he wanted to tell the story, not to mention making it just so, just dead-looking. I mean, it was it fit so well with this world uh, in uh, kind of the post-mortem uh, 
uh, you know, the, the place where all the dead bodies hang out. <laughs> <laughs> the, the morgue? The morgue. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just going to say, it, it just seems like so much more than the morgue because it's like, you know, the just everything is death right now at this particular time yeah. in history in this place. So it was interesting too. I I couldn't help but think, and I know I'm probably fishing for a direct cultural reference here, but I couldn't help but think of of Tony Manero. The influence of American pop culture and media on Tony Manero is is pretty dramatic, right? It's it's overt. The whole thing is about a uh, an American cultural icon. In, in Tony Manero, the character from Saturday Night Fever. And so everything is very vibrant in its sort of, you know, disco, a celebration of American stuff. And in this movie, that that feeling for me was turned on its ear, knowing that the 73 coup is, is largely explained by the American CIA's involvement, subversive involvement in overturning the Allende um, government. And so, like, here you have the first movie of this unofficial trilogy is a celebration of all the American pop culture, and this movie as sort of a reflection of the America's political will. Uh, it, it's I found that a curious um, pairing. I, I kind of couldn't help but but reflect on that as as I watched this film. Yeah, I mean, clearly, you know, Lorraine is an, a director who um, I mean, he's really tapping into elements of the of his country's. Um, just kind of the, how it became to be the country that it is. And I find that pretty interesting. And, um, I'm very curious now to watch the, uh, the last film in the series and see what he does with me, that one. Me too. Let, let's do a uh, first shot, last shot. Yes, let's. Uh, the first shot of the film, we are under a vehicle, like a big, uh, tank of some sort with metal rattling, like a big military crossover with tank tre- treads right by our heads. Rubber tires in front, crushing over debris in the street. Then we cut to Mario off center in his front window, looking outside. And the last shot, uh, geez. So the second to last shot is Nancy, and she is is strangely masturbating Mario in the alley. Uh, and as she finishes, she tells him to bring her cigarettes. And we're in the back of his head, and it's kind of a torso shot. And she steps back into this hole where she is hiding with her paramour, and then we cut down. It's it's like we just move down. So all we see are his legs as he moves the book the the bookshelf back in place to hide her and close the door off so that she and her paramour are hidden. And we spend six minutes watching his legs move as he is moving more and more furniture in front of this door. Now, we've never had this much furniture in front of this door. It has always been just to hide them, but they have been able to get out, and this ostensibly is his effort to uh, end their lives, trap them in there, uh, and and make sure that they can't get out. Um, really creepy. Yeah. It's a... Uh, it's, uh kind of horrifying uh, take on uh, I guess just how uh, political situations like this can can turn people and I, I I think that he was so infatuated with Nancy that he didn't care that she was you know kind of of the communist persuasion um, but clearly um, this last moment uh, kind of is the last straw for him and he just kind of flips a switch and just uh, it's pretty pretty horrifying just watching that last shot I mean it's very long as he just kind of piles stuff in front of the door. Um, and I guess that's the connection is, you know, th- it starts with the military takeover. We see the military coming in and it, it, so it ends on a, it starts on a very big scale and it ends on a very small scale. It's like the ending on the personal, uh, f- uh reflection of what is happening within the country. Yeah. And I think also, you, you know, it, it really cements the, our impression as an audience of his, uh, adaptation to the world around him. And I, I think that's kind of an important angle that, that, you know, the more we sort of talk about it, him as a, as somebody who's, who's sort of drunk the Kool-Aid and is willing to do this kind of a thing, uh, and stand in both moral and, as you say, political judgment, um, at once is, is fascinating to me. Casting uh, by uh, Paula Leoncini uh, and, uh, of course, Alfredo Castro back as Mario. We, we, we've, we agree he's creepy and not all that likable. Uh, what, are your, what are your high points of his well, performance here? I still think that he's a, a great actor because it's a very different character from, Tony Monero, or from Raul in Tony Monero. And um, I, I really enjoy what he's bringing to the table here as an actor. I think he, he's got some some 
great moments of stillness. And uh, I, I, feel, I felt like there was a lot kind of going on. And I, I found him very interesting to watch in this particular film. And, uh, you know, just there's one thing that kind of confused me with him. And it was the, um, the moment where he, um, uh, and, and maybe it's just because I can't quite figure out exactly what Lorraine was, was saying as far as what he's, uh, what his character, what, what he's supporting. But when he finds the guy who is alive, um, he gets uh, Sandra and, uh, you know, they, they save this person. They sneak this, this person who has been shot by the, um, by the military and is in their morgue as a body they're supposed to count. And they take this body secretly over to the hospital, like through the door into the hospital so that the person can get uh, taken care of. You know, if, if what Lorraine is saying that is that this character is really kind of on the side of the new dictatorship taking over and wants to see Pinochet in power, what is he saying by having him save this person? Yeah, that's interesting. It's sort of counter to, to my point, too, of him being disconnected from medicine, because the one case that you could make is that, you know, he sees somebody who's injured rather than dead. Part of his job as somebody who works in a hospital is to save those who are injured and not dead, you know? Right. Uh, and, and so that's, it, it, you know, insofar as it could have been a reflexive response based on his job, uh, I don't know. And then he also saves the dog, which I thought was was uh, kind of touching and nice. I liked that he did that. But then, yeah, this one is the one that really kind of threw me. And I couldn't quite figure out what his character was about. But Well, regardless, it's because he saved the cat in the last movie. <laughs> I know. But regardless, <laughs> I did like Alfredo in this. I, I liked Alfredo, too. I, I don't know what the deal is with all of the creepy masturbation. I don't either. It's weird. Have you seen Jackie? Not yet. I'm, I haven't either, and I'm hoping to before we finish the series, um, just to get a sense of how he directs stories that are you know, outside of the scope of, of, these, of this world that we're looking at, and if he still really likes to focus on these uh, kind of uh, difficult protagonists to connect with. So uh, I guess I'll see when I finally see it. Wait till you see what Jackie does in the White House, in other words. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, yeah, where does he go with that? <laughs> uh, we, we've talked about Nancy a little bit. Antonio Zegers uh, plays Nancy Puelma, uh, and she is the object of Mario's obsession. There were some really interesting moments between these two characters, um, and it just seemed like a... There was an emotional connection between the two of them, and neither of them could exactly let it go. Um, and uh, I, I, the one that really stuck with me is when um, you know she starts breaking down and crying, and then he's breaking down and crying. Uh, and it was like this this really kind of difficult to watch emotional breakdown of the two of them. And then all of a sudden they're you know having sex, and from this you know very kind of close point of view of him kind of watching her um and then all of a sudden they're walking and it's completely silent of them walking and then they're sitting down and they're eating uh, just i mean some strange uh ways to kind of tell their story but I, I i think it was one of those things where i i found them interesting and like there was this odd need for them to be together or at least for her to be with him um even if it was just in silence with him i think it was more just like he was kind of obsessed and, and really wanted her but um but she had a personality. There's something about Nancy that that did draw me in. Well, I think for me, uh, it, it was her opening, you know, her, the first scene that we see her when she's talking and she's sort of defending her position uh, at the the show uh, with the guy who runs the theater uh, was uh, I, I particularly compelling to me. You know, I thought that was a really great sort of defense of who she is as somebody who is aging and he's saying, you're too skinny and you're fired. And she says, you need me like that. She, she comes off with a sense of sort of confidence that, and awareness in the world that, that was a really um, compelling personality. I, I wanted to, to see more. It was a great sort of bit of on-screen charisma uh, that, that didn't necessarily last and, and was, I think, underplayed uh, to my eye over the end of the, over the course of the end of the film. The more uh, she fell out of favor 
with him, and you know, probably intentionally so, uh, she fell out of favor with me. Like she was just on screen less. She was less interesting to look at. Then she starts. You know, it's clear that she's um, sleeping around with other men, and uh, you know that charisma kind of evaporates. I thought that was an interesting transformation. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was an interesting way to play that character. I liked that. Yeah. Anybody else that you want to you want to highlight in the cast? These were the two main uh, characters. We we also have you know we've mentioned Sandra and Doctor Castillo. Um, uh, the um, uh, you know I think Sandra was the the one that I called out as the person I would have rather seen as the perspective character for this film. Yeah, Amparo Noguera. Uh, she uh, was in uh, Tony Manero as his, I guess, love interest in that particular film. Um, and I found her compelling there. I, I liked seeing them on screen together. She's really compelling here, and especially, again, with her quietness. I mean, it's just, you know, this world uh, in the morgue is such a quiet world, and she's so still, and her she's so emotionless. And uh, But then she has this breakdown uh, when she does discover the body of the person she saved, not just that body, but also the body of the nurse that she had turned that person over to. And she has this breakdown and is like shouting at the military and is just horrified by everything that is happening in that moment. Um, that really was uh, kind of the the powerful moment of this film for me. I, aside from seeing the truck after truck of all these dead bodies coming in, which was pretty awful, but uh, really just watching her break down in this realization of what's happening in her world that to me said so much about this film. Totally. And were you not sure that that Captain Montez was going to shoot her? No, I was completely convinced that that was what was about to happen. Isn't that an interesting thing? Like I was too. I I was sure that he was going to shoot her standing in the corner in a sea of bodies. Like they're already there with all the dead bodies. And that they didn't shoot her is as much of a statement to the sort of political climate, uh, I, I think for me, um, as anything else in the film, because the the murders are much of the narrative of what is going on in the morgue in the medical examiner's office is let's find a narrative that explains these dead bodies that isn't what really happened to these dead bodies, right? And and so of course they wouldn't shoot her in front of other people um, that it would have to happen somewhere else. Uh, and and so that was so dark. But you're right; her performance there was great. And and you've already mentioned the the he killed her. He killed himself. No, he was killed. Um, the way that was shot with their faces so close to one another, looking at each other. This is Mario and and Sandra. I it just gave me chills. I thought that was beautifully beautifully uh, illustrated on screen. Yeah, and speaking to that point, I mean, the film was shot by Sergio Armstrong again, um, just like Tony Manero. Um, and I really, you know, I dug this really kind of grim, gross, uh, gray world uh, that they created here. And I, I thought the cinematography and the stillness was such a nice difference from what we saw last time. I really appreciated what they did here, including that conversation, the way they shot that. Talk about, uh, okay, so there are a couple things to talk about with, with Armstrong's work here. The first is, what is up with that aspect ratio? Oh, isn't it crazy? It's like super Man. wide. It is, it is super wide. It was shot at 2.66 to 1. It looks squished. It looks squeezed. And it, in fact, it looks so squeezed in parts. You mentioned this, you know, when they're, they they have sex, then they go walking, then they come back and eat and weep. And when they're crying, <laughs> both of them spend much of, much of the, their crying with their faces out of frame. And it's very strange. The camera doesn't follow them as they weep and their heads nod down toward the table. And so you're looking just at the tops of their heads alternating kind of as they're gasping for air and sobbing. And I found that really distracting. And so I, this is one of those examples where I was super pushed out of my comfort zone. I did not like it. And over the course of the film, I found myself kind of reconnecting to elements of the story in a new way. And I I wrapped up my experience with this film really liking it. Like, I thought that was very cool, um, almost looking at, at the film as a panorama more than just a, you know, sta- the standard frame. Yeah, Time Out actually said the film had humorous, humorously unconventional framings, expressively washed out color tones and mysterious low key performances that bring together human comedy and historical tragedy to unique and surprisingly emotional effect. And that's, I think, what it did for me, too. And it was weird because I also, just like you, I found some of it so kind of just off putting the way that they 
uh, kind of framed things and held on things. And it was so strange sometimes. But by the time I got to the end, like, and we're just staring at his feet as he's moving at uh, moving all this furniture. I'm like, it's it. I mean, it was really fascinating. I, I found it kind of compelling to watch because nothing. It, I mean, it's this world where everything is like topsy turvy all of a sudden and upside down. And I'm like, hey, it actually really kind of ended up working for me at the end. It's it's hypnotic, right? Yeah. When it starts, I'm thinking these people are ridiculous. Why aren't they following the subject? Why are they letting them fall out of frame? Why would they possibly choose to do this? It's it, they're being. This is lazy filmmaking. This is lazy camera. And then at the end, I'm thinking this is really hypnotic. Watching his legs, I. I am not crazy about the six minutes. I think that was a weird choice, uh, you know, to uh, to Lorraine and his uh, <laughs> <love> editor, <laughs> and Andrea Cignoli. I just ran out of patience for it. I mean, I, I think we could have done this in three, maybe two minutes. I I got it. You know? I just felt like I, I was like, it was one of those things where I was like, wow, this is going on forever. And then it started getting funny. I'm like, this is like, <laughs> this is serious. Like, he is really, really unhappy with Did this you woman. notice like... <laughs> like they, they, I don't even think I need to watch it again. I don't think they pulled focus on that either. Like as he is stacking things and moving closer and closer to the camera, I think his legs just go straight up out of focus. Like it's a very strange choice over the course of an uncomfortably long time. <laughs> it really was. Uh, yeah. You, you want to talk about the lenses? Yeah, I, I found it interesting that they shot the film on Russian Lomo lenses, um, which were uh, used in the 70s by filmmakers like Andrei Tarkovsky and other Russian filmmakers. Um, the lenses were designed for 35 millimeter film, but um, Lorraine and Armstrong shot this film on 16 millimeter. Um, and Lorraine said it ended up creating this very special look. And I'm sure that's also lent to that uh, really wide aspect ratio. Um, and then Lorraine also went on to say, this is a quote of his, and then when we were shooting, we were doing all kinds of lighting setups and we never liked anything that we had. One day we had an electrical problem and all the lighting we had set up went down before we started shooting. So I asked for somebody to turn on the lights for the room. And when I looked at the monitor, I realized that I really liked the idea of using very regular light coming from the ceiling, but a lot of them. We created this very plain array so the film would have this public lighting look. It also made sense because there was a certain politic to it. And after the test, we realized that it actually did work because it creates such muted colors with very little shadows. And we liked that. It was plain. It was grainy. And the color palette was very special. So we only used regular light bulbs hung up all over the set, but mostly from the ceiling. It's crazy, but it's interesting. I, I think it's, and these are those like kind of like happy accidents that happen in filmmaking that when you're making a film that takes place in the morgue, it's like, oh, this is kind of, this actually lends itself to what we're doing. I, I found myself really a- attracted to it. You know, I, 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 I think that grit combined with the, the, the crazy aspect ratio uh, just made for a really interesting environment. And you know where it really works, it, particularly in the in the operating theater, uh, it just fills the whole frame with a body. Right? right, whether they're yeah. looking head down at the body or uh, sideways, parallel to the body, it fills the frame with a body. And in a movie called Post Mortem, you better have a great framing of a body. Right, and and it just really, it just looks great. Yeah, I I was really, I mean, in in terms of of Armstrong's work on this, I was, uh, you know, I felt like. I was re- reserving judgment on what I thought of the camera work after Tony Manero, and and I I found myself really in favor of the choices that they made with this film. I thought it I thought it was really m- interesting to watch. You know where else that that framing works and the just the look of the grit. We have a number of times where we we jump back to the the front of his house and his head is somewhere in the window, looking outside. Right there is this sort of yeah, yeah. Uh, peeping Tom kind of stalker thing that you've mentioned, and and that's another opportunity where the frame looks so good the yellow looks so grungy of the paint on the outside of his house i thought it was just great and that goes to you know production design hair makeup costumes everybody involved really again worked to create this brilliant brilliantly disgusting looking world of <laughs> 1973 chile <laughs> Um, we, we've already mentioned Andrea uh, Cignoli uh, editing uh, we some really choice cuts yeah, again, with the jump cuts, just like our, our last film. But the thing that I loved so much was there was this fantastic cut from we have an autopsy that's happening, and we cut from that right to everybody eating. <laughs> it was just like, <laughs> it just was one of those cuts that just like really made me sick. I'm like, oh, 
man, yeah. I was just looking at a dead body, and now they're all stuffing their faces. And then weirdly, like they all go off and brush their teeth together. I really couldn't figure out like this work environment. Like, what are these doctors <laughs> doing? Let's all brush our teeth in like a in like a co-ed bathroom. It was a strange moment, but yeah. Um, but um, but I did I did like the editing of this film, and I I really appreciated that they held on shots for such long periods of time. Especially some shots that were uncomfortable to watch. You know, there was a there was a shot of of them sewing up the carcass of, uh, right. and in one sequence. And, uh, you know, here's another thing. Here's another thing, Andy. Did they did they jump around with time? I in this movie, think so. So wait a minute. There is a sequence. I may end up cutting all this <laughs> because I, this may be just me not understanding how the movie was put together. There was a sequence early in the film where they're doing this autopsy and the person that they name in the chart is Nancy. Right. And then uh, later in the film, she's still alive. Right. So that was, but but it was never really clear to me how they were messing with the timeline for us. I didn't, I didn't think they were messing with the timeline. I just assumed it was a different Nancy, but... Now that you say that, it's interesting if they were. Uh, that certainly puts a different perspective on that particular uh, examination because he really doesn't seem to be uh, paying much attention or, or really kind of surprised that it might be his Nancy. Yeah, I thought that was very strange or else he didn't really have a connection with that Nancy. I, I thought that that was, that was his Nancy and that all the stuff in the, in the, um, uh, in the, the operating theater was happening at some point later after all of the drama uh, of, that was happening on the streets and his relationship with her was building. And then, you know, and, and so the scene where she's on the operating theater is actually after they discover her dead in the hole in his wall. Did they, I mean, she's credited as Nancy Puelma. Do you remember the name that they give to that Nancy? Yes, Andy, it, I, I do remember it was Nancy Puelma. It's a, uh, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Miguel Hormazabal is back on sound. He was he was on sound for for the last film, right? I remember I you struggling over his last name last time, so I'm assuming. So, so yes, he was. <laughs> I you know what I really enjoyed about this is the way that the sound kind of played off screen. There were there were a number of times where you had action happening off screen uh, of of things happening in the political world, and we're just kind of focusing on Mario. Um, I thought that was a great way to kind of tell the story of the bigger picture by just hearing these things. Um, the one that really stands out for me is when he's taking a shower and we can hear, we see him through the window and he's hearing none of it because he's in the shower, but we can hear basically like the the government coming in and, and, and raising Nancy's place and kidnapping her uh, her brother and father. And I thought that was really interesting to play it that way. I, I, I think that they found a great way to kind of tell that story, kind of like with Tony Monero, where things were always, it seemed like they were just around the corner. It's the same sort of thing here, but we're hearing it. And I liked that. I thought that was a great way to kind of hint at this bigger world. Well, you're right. It is a kind of a direct homage to Tony Monero when, and and I think his performance too uh, is very similar. Where something horrific is going on outside the window, and he not too excitedly gets his pants on to go check it out. Right? Like <laughs> it's the same kind of that he he just doesn't seem like he's all that interested in re- what's really going on. And in this case, it's it's a massive bit of travesty going on outside his window. Oh yes, so, yes, indeed. that was interesting. How did it do at awards season? Did it uh, did it take over? Uh, did it did it take over the world? It didn't quite take over the world, although it did uh, end up competing at the sixty seventh uh, Venice International Film Festival, where it, it was nominated for Golden Lion, and uh, unfortunately Pablo Larraín uh, lost to Sofia Coppola for somewhere. Interestingly, competing also against Kelly Reichert's Meek's Cutoff. Um, so I, now I'm I'm more and more curious about that film by Sofia Coppola. I really want to kind yeah. of check it out. Um, other than that, it did get like I think four awards and four no- other nominations. Uh, two of the ones, the Chileans Altazor Awards, um, both Antonia Zegers and Alfredo Castro were nominated for Best Actress and Actor, respectively. Um, she lost to Blanca Lewin in The Life of Fish, and he lost to Santiago Cabrera in The Life of Fish. And uh, so, you know, it, it was one of those films that I, I think it got some festival buzz. Um, but it didn't quite ever, you know, break into you know the big time. It's it's a tricky film to watch. 
Uh, how about the numbers? I assume that you have carried on your relationship with uh, <laughs> Mr. Lorraine's brother. I I have not. He kind of just, you know, I got the definitive he stopped, answer. He stopped writing. <laughs> not getting anything from him. But yeah, like last <laughs> week, I, I still couldn't find any budget info for this one. Uh, not even an article like I at least found last time to hint at uh, at how much money they had to spend. The movie premiered September 5th, uh, 2010 at the, like I said, the Venice International Film Festival before its Chilean release November 24th, 2010 and U.S. release April 11th, 2012. I couldn't find any info as to how it did in Chile or the rest of the world, but here in the States, the film opened the same weekend as Cabin in the Woods, Lockout, and everybody's favorite, The Three Stooges, but only ever played on just one screen. I'm guessing L.A. or New York, where it played for five and a half weeks. Movie ended up making nine thousand seven hundred fifty dollars domestically, or ten thousand seven hundred twenty-five in today's dollars. Uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted because uh, Andy, while you were while you were reading that, which was really good, by the way. I mean, it was one of your better <laughs> numbers. I did look up somewhere in Letterbox to add it to my watch list because I am also curious. And the number one review. <laughs> Is I, I fell asleep more times watching this movie than Stephen Dorff did in the movie. I feel accomplished. <laughs> it's a one star. It Ouch. did not did not do all that well. So uh, anyhow, I, I added it to my watch list anyway because I so think it's there. something you would do. Yeah. Well, there you go. Uh, fascinating. And Andy, I think it's time for us to rank it. Let's do it. Head over to flickchart.com slash the next reel or just swipe over to the show notes on your podcast player of choice and tap on the flick chart word. There's a, it's a link. It'll take you right over, thanks to the wonders of the internet, to our uh, to the, the movie on Flickchart, and you could add it to your list. And let's see, Andy, I'm surprised. I ranked this in my own account, and it did not drop to the bottom. That's a good thing, Pete. That's a good thing. It is. It is. I feel good. Well, let's see where it goes here. First up, postmortem or hot fuzz. Well, hot fuzz. It has to let's not get fuzz. let's not really <laughs> let's too, not go crazy too excited. Here. Come on. Postmortem or Christmas in July. Christmas in July for me. Christmas in July. Postmortem or Labor Day. We had some problems with Labor Day. Had some problems. Uh, I ended up kind of liking it more than probably most people in the world did, but uh, I think you didn't uh, have the same love that I did. No. I'm still picking no, Postmortem actually here. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go with Postmortem too. Postmortem or The Little Foxes. Betty Davis, 1941. Post- I think uh, Postmortem. <sighs> yeah, I think I am too. Postmortem or Seconds. Seconds for me, please. Yeah, seconds. Postmortem or Troll Hunter, give me the trolls. Yes, Troll Hunter. <laughs> Postmortem or The Untouchables. Uh, the Untouchables. Absolutely. Postmortem or Metropolis. Oh, we're going with Fritz Lang, Metropolis. Yeah, I, I think I would too. Postmortem or From Hell from the Hughes Brothers. Let's say, ooh. I'd probably say Postmortem. I'd probably say from hell. Interestingly, they're both about examinations of uh, of a lot of dead people. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, I could, I, I could be easily swayed. For me, I, I, I just, just think have to. Yeah, postmortem is a, a harder film to watch, and I, I think a lot of it is just you know, from hell is a really pretty film, even if it's a bloody film. Yeah. All right. I'll give you. I'll give you from hell. Well, that puts it at 245, 245 out of 301. So, but it's 245 out of 301 and it's a film that I I I was entertained. I was entertained, Andy. Yeah. The last week I I was not entertained. I consider that a gift. I this was a, a dramatic improvement for me even though it didn't leap to the top of our flick chart. No, I and, and this one, I, even with a protagonist that was still difficult, I mean, it wasn't as bad as last week's, um, there was just some really interesting, compelling stuff happening here. Um, if anything, it made me really kind of want to see a film that really d- jumps into the political nature of, of Chile yeah. 1973. I think that there's just a, a fantastic story waiting to be told there. I absolutely agree. And even so, uh, on Letterboxd, I, I started this when I first ranked the film. It came in at two stars for me. But after our conversation, I just gave it an extra half star. Uh, and I credit that to you. This Aww. was, uh, I think this was a great, uh, great conversation. I appreciate that. Well, that's exactly where I am. Two and a half stars. Oh. So there you go. Look at that. Well, there you right go. Right down the middle. That's post-mortem. right. Post-mortem. Okay, so this is the second in our... 
uh, Pablo Larraine series, and we are wrapping it up with the third in the unofficial trilogy. Uh, where do we go from here? Yeah, we are going to be uh, hitting up his his final film, and like you said, this so-called trilogy, with a film that's relatively recent. It's his film, No, which is very difficult to uh, to find when you're searching for it, because unfortunately, it's, it's way too common of a word. <laughs> it's a, just an impossible thing to search for. Uh, you almost have to just look up Pablo Lorraine and find it there. But uh, yeah, this is the film from 2012, starring uh, Gael Garcia Bernal, and uh, it's it's kind of the end of the uh, the Pinochet era in the late '80s, as an in-demand advertising man working in Chile has to come up with uh, a it's just kind of the the advertising uh, tactics in political campaigns. And so, I'm very curious to see this one. It was nominated for Best Foreign Language Film, and uh, yeah, it'll be an interesting end to this trilogy. And then after we watch it, we could go watch Blindness again. <laughs> Oh, let's. <laughs> that was terrible. I liked it. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, anyway, hey, this was uh, this was this was good. I feel like we're moving in the right direction. I am optimistic about next week, and uh, I really look forward to know. Uh, and uh, there you go. Until then, Andy, I'm I'm gonna go to bed. All right, man. I've got some furniture. I've got to go move. Amazon giveth, Andy. As Amazon always doeth. It does every week. It giveth something. And this week, there there are not a lot of critical reviews of this film. Does that surprise you? There are not a lot of reviews, period, for this film. <laughs> well, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> it's kind of hard to come by, but uh, we, we do have a couple. Why don't you, would, would you go first? Why don't you go first and we'll move up from the bottom? Sounds good. I have a two-star by Kerry B. Barad on uh, September 21st, 2012. He says, An extremely slow subtitled film with time-consuming scenes of people staring, a man masturbating, neighbors crying, a man driving, and eggs sizzling in a skillet. Minimal dialogue adds to the tediousness. The context of the traumatic Chilean political upheaval and counter-revolution of 1973 is pretty interesting, as are the scenes pertaining to the ethics of mortuary science in wartime. Unfortunately, these get limited play in the overall narrative scheme. Unless you are particularly interested in movies that are more art than drama, you probably won't care for this one. Boy, he uh, lays it out. Carrie uh, lays it pretty out. Much, uh, pretty much. Pretty much. I've got a similar one from uh, Andrew who says, three stars, he says, I'm missing something. I think I'm missing something. I get the feeling there's something deeper here I'm not getting, and maybe my detachment from the political aspects of this film are what is serving up my coldness toward the film. But despite certain obvious flaws, I just couldn't completely fall in line with this film. The atmosphere here is pretty entrancing. You can't look away, even if nothing is happening, and a lot of time it feels as though you're watching paint dry, the lighting here is an infectious mixture of grit and rawness. The closing scene is brilliant, simply brilliant, and it is in that closing moment that my doubts about the rest of the film start to fray. Maybe I am missing something, or maybe it is just one of those films that contain a really impressive and deeply unsettling scene and nothing else. I'm still not sure. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he said it. Oh, my. Oh, my. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Amazon. It is hard to believe that we have been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. Oh, I know. You're telling me. Producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Just visit thenextreel.com slash originals. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great conversations. In Season 6, our Disease Films series had adaptations like The Omega Man, based on I Am Legend, The Andromeda Strain, Children of Men, and Blindness. I Am Legend is so much better than The Omega Man. What about the Will Smith version? Don't get me started. For our This Is Real Life Jack series, we talked Black Hawk Down and Seabiscuit. 
some great true stories based on fantastic books. And we had more listeners' choices like The Fly, The Emigrants, and Scott Pilgrim vs. The World. You just did a series on The Fly on the Sitting in the Dark podcast. Did you read the original material? Wasn't watching every Fly movie enough? (laughs) Our Big Betty Davis series featured adaptations like The Little Foxes, Now Voyager, All About Eve, and Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Are you calling Betty Davis big? Only in personality and force. She is a force to be reckoned with. We talked about the entire The Godfather trilogy, of course. Iconic page to screen, even if it is just the one Mario Puzo book. I wonder if Coppola will ever make The Sicilian. We also had some Zhang Yimou adaptations with Judo and Raise the Red Lantern. Absolutely gorgeous movies. And don't forget the Hughes Brothers series with From Hell, based on the graphic novel. Brilliant material. Kelly Reichardt gave us Wendy and Lucy and Certain Women, adapted from short stories. Plus more Hayao Miyazaki as we tackled Howl's Moving Castle. Find all these books and more at thenextreel.com slash originals. Every purchase supports the show. Get the full list of adapted films that we've covered at thenextreel.com slash originals and start your next read today. 